The hue and cry being made by some quarters over the activities of the National Industrial and Commercial Investments Limited Company, NISIL, and what they term its lack of accountability, have been dismissed by President Ramatar. The audited account of the entity up to the year 2012 have been presented to the National Assembly. And I haven't heard a single comment on the, on the audit, audits that have been laid in the National Assembly since 2012. I haven't heard them questioning anything on it. On it. Suddenly they're making a um, hue and cry. I think Dr. Luncheon dealt with this issue at his last press conference, pointing out that all the, this, all the, the position that Nissel took have been cleared by the government. So I don't, again, I think they're creating um, all kinds of anomalies and creating all kinds of issues where, um, where issues actually don't exist. The sales mandate is to effectively, responsibly, and transparently manage, monitor, develop, improve, and hold or dispose of the company's assets and engage in developmental projects that collectively will contribute positively to the development of Guyana and its people. The entity has spearheaded several of Ghana's major transformational projects, such as the Marriott Hotel, the Burbis River Bridge, the Chedi Jagan International Airport Expansion Project, and the Amalia Falls Hydro Project. Whilst the DEA's formal announcement of a local office is welcomed by the ruling administration, there must be the necessary legislative framework to ensure that legal loopholes are present to prosecute lawbreakers. Passing of the AML CAFT bill is at the core of that development. As I've said, the, that bill is an anti-corruption bill and it's an anti-narcotics drugs bill. And if you don't want to support that, then objectively you're on the side of criminals uh, and, 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 and money launderers and all of that. That is what you're actually defending. And I don't know if that is what is taking place. The president added that the legislation will help to equip local law enforcement agencies and the DEA and strengthen their capacity to deal with miscreants. It could give us much more international cooperation to create a very inhospitable climate here for our, um, for our, our, um, for those who are engaged in any kind of these type of activities. The United States Drug Enforcement Agency will also support the strengthening of the capacity of its local counterparts by providing additional training support and equipment to units to ensure that they are fully vetted and have the ability and capacity to operate. The announcement was made on June 26 at a joint press conference between the President and U.S. Ambassador Dr. Brent Hart at the Office of the President. The DEA's office will be stationed at the United States Embassy in Kingston, Georgetown. By cutting the administrative arm of the Office of the President's funding, the allocation for the provision of the Head of State Security has been removed. This action can compromise the security of President Donald Ramutar. This move sets a dangerous precedent and is unacceptable for any Head of State, government or right-thinking people of a democratic nation. The disapproval of funds by the political opposition for the Ministry of Finance's administrative arm means that students wishing to attend the University of Guyana will not be able to access any loans for 2014. The move will prevent many students who are unable to pay cash from studying and having a tertiary education. Most of these students are underprivileged and are unable to afford higher education to further their development and increase job opportunities. Government's efforts to continue the improvement of medical services have been negatively affected by the decision of the parliamentary opposition to cut funding for the specialty hospital and the medical sector. This move means that monies for the provision of medical gear for doctors and nurses, along with new equipment for hospitals and clinics such as those at Port Kaituma, Linden, Kokwani and Bartika, and new ambulances have not been approved. This move by the political opposition will adversely affect the provision and delivery of health care in communities across Guyana.
The Government Information Agency, GINA, evolved from the Government Information Service and was formally launched in 2002. GINA is executing its mandate of keeping Guyanese, both locally and in the diaspora, informed of government's programs and policies pertinent to development. Cognizant of the right of Guyanese to information, GINA, through its dedicated staff, has endeavored to deliver its mandate to the best of its ability. Guyanese have every right to be informed on policies, programs and projects which impact on their lives. The Government Information Service was in operation long before the PPPC administration took office and discharged the same mandate. GINA is a unit of the Office of the President and its mandate is similar to other organizations around the world where governments have a fixed body to disseminate their information. GINA will endeavor to remain steadfast to its mandate and takes pride in continuing to serve the people of Guyana. GINA, Information for Nation Building. As part of his agenda, whilst attending the 35th CARICOM Heads of Government meeting, President Ramatar met with Guyanese business leaders domiciled in Antigua and Barbuda. While we have made great strides, we also have many challenges, and, but I think that with perseverance, we will overcome them, and our intention is to take our country to the next level to move from being, when we got into the government, we were described as a heavily, a hippie country, heavily indebted poor country. We are now described as a lower middle income country. And what we are working for is to make, carry our country to the status of a developed country status. That is what we want. That is our goal. That, we, we, that is what we are working towards. And I want to say once again, I thank you for the support, the moral support, the material support that you have given, even though you are not at home, but we know that hope is always within you, and I want to thank you very much for that. And I, with your support, I am absolutely certain that we will achieve our goals of making Guyana a far better place where we can have a higher quality of life for all our people. Thank you for your attention. According to CARICOM, regional business leaders will now be engaged with a view to sustaining and enhancing the region's economic fortunes. These engagements will be conducted via CARICOM's Commission on the Economy. The fact that the Guyanese economy has had eight years of consecutive economic growth despite the world's overall economic slump was highlighted by the President as well as the gains in various local sectors. We have been continuously able to expand our, our social services. We have... Uh, very close to having universal secondary education in our country. Um, our health services have improved considerably. And a lot of this, the housing area, I think we have, we have done a lot in, um, in being able to uh, ease the pressure on the housing situation in Guyana. And so I think um, generally we have been working hard. It has been difficult, but we have been pushing ahead. The need for cheap, reliable energy was described by President Ramasar as a challenge to be overcome in the push to sustain economic growth. Even the investors, we, are, we brought them down to Guyana to have meeting with the opposition so that they will know that if they have any doubt if they think we do with any underhand deal or if we get anything under the table, here are the people there to talk to them. We did all of that. Then we took, they said they wanted to see the fall and the road. We took them on the road that we were building. We took them over the we could at that time we didn't build the road right up to the falls as yet. We flew them over the falls so they can see it. They come back and when they came back they gave comments to the press and they said that they were very impressed and everything else. I thought they were the pass the day. Lo and behold, they voted against it in the National Assembly. So my friend it's not a question of not talking. I talk and talk till, but I'm a talk man, I'm a talk more. So we can see what will happen. The need for collaboration across the region as part of efforts to enhance sustainable energy supplies was one of the topics discussed during the high level CARICOM meeting. <laughs> Thank you.
As CARICOM continues its push for regional integration, the need for infrastructure to realize this goal was highlighted by the president. There's clearly no uh, resistance. People live very easily with each other. People, as I said, the fact that we have one history has helped a lot. People, uh, there's a strong feeling of Caribbean-ness among, among people. So it's the physical, uh, the real infrastructure that we have to put in place that will accelerate the, the integration of CARICOM uh, as a whole, including the OECS countries. The Organization of Eastern Caribbean States, itself a subgroup of CARICOM, can benefit from great economies of scale in terms of trade, said the president, who's a trained economist. They'll have a bigger market, um, even though it's still a small market in terms of the global situation and environment that we live in, but it's better than one country. Um, and I also know that there's a lot of um, joint efforts in, in the OECS where they were um, purchasing goods together and benefiting again from some of these things. So I think this, and I know that for a fact, when I used to be going to Europe and so on, there's a lot of shared diplomatic um, responsibilities, mm -hmm. all of which I think are really uh, important. CARICOM should be looking at some of those examples mm -hmm. that where we can save cut costs by sharing um, um, embassies, diplomatic um, expenses and so forth, so that we can, we have to, we have to be out there in the international arena. Mm -hmm. we, can't seek, we can't avoid that, we must be there for our countries, for the region as a whole. But at the same time, we can do it in a cheaper way, so that we can have more resources to spend within the countries itself. Among issues discussed during the three-day high-level meeting were climate change, economic and immigration issues, and challenges affecting the region, all of which are to be addressed via CARICOM's strategic plan. During the meeting, President Ramatar, the holder of CARICOM's agricultural portfolio, spearheaded discussions on the region's need for better food security, climate change preparations, and joint ventures in the agriculture sector. President Ramatar revealed some of his expectations following the conclusion of the recent 35th CARICOM Heads of Government meeting in Antigua and Barbuda. I think um, we must be realistic with our expectations and these things. I think that we have gone a far way in integrating, but I know many people are disappointed. They feel that we can probably go much faster. Um, but in my view, I, um, I think that um, the process is irreversible. I think we're moving closer and closer together. It's going to take time. We, we, are, we are relatively newly independent countries. So I think a lot of countries still want to feel their uh, own sovereignty. So we have to understand some of these things. But if you look at the institutions that are developing, um, we have the Caribbean Court of Justice, which I think is a very important institution. Um, the University of the West Indies, uh, many of these institutions are creating stronger and stronger bonds to the Caribbean people. He noted that there are still challenges facing the nation's member states, particularly given the geographical layout of the 15 member countries. It's not one landmass like Europe is, and so the integration process is probably much easier there. We are separated, we are separated by the sea in some way, so we have challenges with air transportation, with maritime transportation. But I think that these are the issues in the future that we will have to look at, create the infrastructure to solve many of these problems and so that we can, um, we can then be, begin to talk about accelerating the integration process. So there's still a lot of infrastructural work that needs to be done. The trade, we mean, Guyana can do much more trade with Antigua for that matter, but we don't have a good maritime service um, here. So we, all of these things we have to look into and to see how we can solve many of these problems so that we can accelerate our integration. Regional integration and the need for a common market economy have been at the forefront of CARICOM's agenda since its formation in 1973. The move by government via Finance Minister Dr. Ashne Singh to restore budgetary allocations is in keeping with the Constitution's legal requirements, according to President Ramatar. He questioned the reasons behind some of the criticisms being made following this decision. Largely because in 2012, 
and 2013, we did exactly the same thing. And the opposition voted for many of them in the National Assembly. And it is totally within the Constitution. Everything we do, we do it within the Constitution. If you go to Article 2, 18, 3 of the Constitution, you will see very, very clearly that the Constitution has given us that right to go to the Constitution and to take these matters to the Parliament, to the National Assembly, to take it back to the National Assembly. So clearly, why are they plugging this line that is unconstitutional when they themselves participated in this process in 2012 and 2013? And they didn't see it as being unconstitutional then. Why are they now branding it unconstitutional? The president explained that the monies being restored are for critically needed programs and initiatives that foster development across various communities. These monies are the Amerindian Development Fund, and we feel very strongly that we have to put this money to try to, to develop our interior community, to catch up with the rest of the coastal areas and so forth. It is um, a lot of the other LCDS. It's the U University of Guyana um, student loans that are being put back. I don't know if that is, the, 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 that is unjustified, that they, they, they're ready to vote that out. Um, it is paying salaries to the office of the president. Um, if the executive is to carry out his function effectively on behalf of the nation, we have to, to, to um, put that in place. In fact, I think the cutting of the money for the office of the president was totally unconstitutional on their part. And in fact, if you had taken it to the court, I'm sure we would have won. He reiterated that all of the actions taken to restore the critically needed funds are within the ambit of the Constitution. So all this noise that they're making, really, for what purpose? It seems to be some sinister purpose that they have in mind to, 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 be, to be making all of these claims. That these things, they did it, they participated with this in 2013 and 2012. And this is all that we're doing again. Um, to, because the Constitution, and I must say that we, within the Constitution, we're doing this thing within the Constitution and all of that. The importance of road linkages in Guyana's hinterland to propel economic growth and improve access to services is fully recognized. To this end, Budget 2014 has allocated $1 billion to rehabilitate critical interior roads, including the Linden to Lethem Road. Government's investment in rural development will be further strengthened this year with the sum of $1 billion which has been provided in the 2014 national budget. The sum will go towards infrastructure such as roads, bridges, drainage and irrigation, and community market facilities, along with entrepreneurial activity in rural communities. Parents with school-aged children will achieve a measure of relief with a provision of $10,000 per school year for all school children in the public schools. This, from the 2014 budget, is in addition to the school uniform voucher, which will continue to be distributed. The 2014 national budget has allocated $32.3 billion for education as government continues to emphasize the sector which has undergone significant transformation in response to the emerging needs of society. A message from the Government Information Agency. The Government Information Agency, GINA, evolved from the Government Information Service and was formally launched in 2002. GINA is executing its mandate of keeping Guyanese, both locally and in the diaspora, informed of government's programs and policies pertinent to development. Cognizant of the right of Guyanese to information, GINA, through its dedicated staff, has endeavored to deliver its mandate to the best of its ability. Guyanese have every right to be informed on policies, programs, and projects which impact on their lives. The Government Information Service was in operation long before the PPPC administration took office and discharged the same mandate. GINA is a unit of the Office of the President and its mandate is similar to other organizations around the world where governments have a fixed body to disseminate their information. GINA will endeavor to remain steadfast to its mandate and takes pride in continuing to serve the people of Guyana. GINA, information for nation building.